Well, welcome to the last session of the 2018 FLC uh, conference, right? Was it a good conference for you? I, I really can't under, under uh, what's the word? I, it's, it's so late in the conference, I, don't even, I can't even come up with the right words, right? But really, really need you to do those conference surveys from sessions to the whole thing. We really, really look at those. And as we look at for next year, it's, uh, we really want to meet your needs for both networking and education and just growth as a profession. So, but kind of as our capstone, there you've been elevated, sir. Um, we really do, um, are, we're just incredibly blessed to have Dr. Copan here. And, and you've heard me really plug it every time I was up talking because it's so special with this point in time where we are and our professional profession of tech transfer that we have this type of a champion support. And I'm just gonna cherry pick some of the things that I think are relevant from his bio. And you can see how long it is and I even had to go to 10 font. Um, and you get to correct whatever I say that's incorrect, sir. Um, he's an American chemist and government official who currently serves as the Under Secretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology. Uh, prior to this, he served as President and CEO of IP Engineering Group Corp and as a board member of the Rocky Mountain Innovation Partners. He's also been, and where I mentioned to you earlier, where he's been a practitioner. He's one of us, right? He's come home, and if he doesn't believe that, I'm going to keep telling him that, right? He's come home to, to his people, um, and where he was, he was the director of technology commercialization partnerships at Brookhaven National Lab, and also as a tech transfer guy at uh, NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. So he's, he's, again, done what we do, and he's managed what we've done. A couple other neat things is he led the clean diesel technologies onto NASDAQ. So he's basically taking a company pro uh, public, right? right. Um, as serving as CTO and executive vice president. He was also been with Lubrizol. Did I pronounce that right? Lubrizol Corporation, yep. Where, he's, where he was active in research development and business unit management. Um, and he's worked all around the world. Are you still on the board of LES? No. No, but yeah. you were at one I point. I was, yeah, for about and, 12 years. And he's also been part of the National Advisory Council for the FLC. So he's been a practitioner. He's also been outside looking at us as a National Advisory Council. And with that, I'd, I'd like you to help me welcome him warmly home, Dr. Copan. Hey. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. This is awesome. I um, totally feel at home. And uh, I see many many friends in this, uh, in this group, and uh, uh, others I've perhaps seen at previous uh, FLC meetings. Um, so thank you once again, uh, John. I'd like to say thanks especially to uh, Paul Zielinski and uh, Courtney Silverthorne, my uh, good colleagues at, uh, at NIST. Um, Rick Trotter, it's great to see you again. Uh, I started off with the National Advisory Council um, in the uh, mid-1990s and, and served um, uh, until I uh, joined the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. And, uh, and so what I'd like to do today is to deliver a challenge to each of you. Um, I'll begin with a little bit of a context on uh, NIST, uh, which is the host agency, as you know, for the Federal Laboratory Consortium, and a little bit about why this is important to me and why this is part of my job and uh, our job at the Department of Commerce. I'll also take a few minutes to chat a little bit about intellectual property, um, the um, intellectual property rights and, and protections that we have in this country um, have eroded over the past years. And uh, we're embarking on a journey uh, to address some of those issues as well. Um, and. Um, so I'll also talk briefly about standards. So NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technologies, um, has uh, quite a role to play on behalf of the federal government. And um, it's an important part of commerce, uh, international trade, but increasingly it's been applied to intellectual property uh, matters. And uh, you're familiar, of course, with standards essential patents and uh, how important they are to licensing of, uh, of intellectual assets. And um, I believe that the whole topic of standards is an important one 
for also the Federal Laboratory uh, Consortium to uh, participate and, uh, and to engage. Um, and my real focus today is to share with you our initiative on unleashing American innovation. Uh, this is the lab to market cross agency priority goal as part of the president's management agenda. It's been a priority for the nation over the past several years together with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. And uh, it was uh, announced by the White House several weeks ago um, and so this is a new uh, initiative called ROI, Return on Investment, uh, that's being led by NIST together with the Department of Commerce and the Office of Science and Technology Policy to enhance the return on investment to the American people, to our economy, and to the U.S. taxpayers from the investment in each of our laboratories. It's over $150 billion per year across all federal agencies. The work is done by our universities, our research institutes, and our federal laboratories. And um, it's, it, this is our moment, Federal Labs. I believe that we have a tremendous chance to work together as part of this initiative um, and to change the rules of engagement, to address some of the issues that have held us back, um, to look not only at, at policies and procedures, but uh, we have people on Capitol Hill that are looking to support legislative changes to make it more effective for the federal laboratories, indeed for all federally funded research and development to get into the marketplace more effectively. So a little bit about uh, NIST, our mission and why uh, we are connected with the FLC um, is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness. NIST advanced measurement science standards and technology. And these core uh, issues cut across the entire uh, domain of the U.S. commercial enterprise. So whether it's a legacy industry like, like steel or limestone, or if it's emerging technology like biopharmaceuticals, or the emergence of uh, the next generation of, of 5G wireless standards, um, uh, NIST really kind of deals with the gamut of technologies. Now, intellectual property rights, um, these are American rights. And uh, intellectual property is truly property, and it's an essential ingredient of our innovation system. So the clarity and the enforceability of IP rights are an American right for the benefit of U.S. commerce and for the practice of useful arts and sciences as seen by the founders of our nation. Um, NIST was actually written into the Article I of the U.S. Constitution in terms of the directive uh, for measures and, uh, and standards and, and uh, currencies of, uh, of this country uh, to become a world power. And side by side with that, in 1790, the Patent Act uh, was put in place, signed by George Washington, and they were very strong and clear intellectual property rights. Um, but unlike the United Kingdom, after which the U.S. patent system was initially developed, um, these were rights for the individual. These were rights for small inventors. These were the rights for people who did not have a major corporation or the power of the crown behind them. Um, and, uh, and so it was a uniquely American intellectual property system that was created. And above one of the doors that I used to get into the Department of Commerce offices, the uh, Hoover Building uh, in downtown DC, is a quote by Abraham Lincoln. The US patent system adds the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. Um, and that inspiring quote, and I, many of you I'm sure have heard it, uh, reminds me, reminds us at the Department of Commerce and at the US Patent and Trademark Office why we're there and why this is important to America. And so yes indeed, uh, entrepreneurs, small companies, global corporations, universities, and even the federal government are non-practicing entities of certain intellectual property rights. Uh, and we have seen through legislation, through 
some unintended consequences of, of well-meaning uh, lower court actions, Supreme Court actions, um, and some direct assaults on the system. The U.S. patent system um, has lost some of its inherent strength and respect and asset value. And I can assure you that uh, together with Andre uh, Iancu, the head of the Patent and Trademark Office, we are working together to see that the value of granted upheld U.S. claims can now be restored and uh, that patent stakeholders need to be heard as part of this process. And I'm really delighted that the intellectual property and technology transfer community is coming together. So today we hear a lot about U.S intellectual property innovation relative to other countries. And our patents and trademarks, our copyrights and trade secrets at the state and federal jurisdictions are part of our toolkit of innovation. So let's not forget that. It's not just patent rights. Um, we now see that Asian entities file more than 40% of US patent applications. Um, and China's patent system uh, is increasing in reliability and stature. Um, and we see that patents and trade and standards are increasingly interconnected. Um, we are working together with the Patent and Trademark Office now on issues that affect intellectual property commerce and, and licensing. And uh, standards provide a common ground, a common language and framework uh, for trade and for transactions. And they allow it's two sides of a negotiating party to get to, to get together because a standard has been established. Um, and say they, don't, they don't need to renegotiate all of those basic terms and conditions because they're already built into a standard. Um, and so this concept is something that is being um, addressed now by the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, and uh, the organization called the Licensing Executive Society, or LES, has a standards process in place that's looking to standardize some of the basics of intellectual property negotiations, intellectual asset management, valuation, standards essential patent licensing, FRAND licensing, which is the fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory licensing terms that are often used in the high-tech sector. Um, and so, um, I believe as a standards organization, as the lead in standards uh, for the federal government, uh, that it's important for NIST also to take a hard look at that with the Patent and Trademark Office and look at the opportunities that that represents for federal labs as well uh, to see if there are certain standards that can more easily allow industry to engage uh, with the federal labs. So we are in a world where over 90% of trade is driven by standards and other nations are organizing themselves in recognizing this and China, for example, is really um, playing by the rules of engagement on the documentary standards process and they are playing to win. And so it's an opportunity for the US to look at commerce and standards more broadly and IP transaction standards will certainly benefit from this as well. My primary message for you today is about a new initiative called Unleashing American Innovation. We had an event on Thursday of last week in Washington, D.C. Uh, it was a launch event as part of the president's management agenda, and it's a true interagency initiative uh, that's led by NIST and the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and folks, we are all part of this. Um, a preview uh, was provided to uh, some of the um, uh, technical societies, to the licensing executive society, and uh, to the Association of University Technology Managers, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and, and a number of others to just kind of try to prime the pump a little bit. Um, but uh, we are uh, launching now. There is a federal register notice that uh, is going to be published within the next few days. According to the federal publication cycle, it appears that it's going to be out on Tuesday of, of next week. So be on the lookout for that as well as a press release. Um, it's a request for information, um, an RFI. And that means we want feedback from the community on a number of important issues related to federal technology transfer and technology transfer from 
the academic community. Part of the reason for this is federally funded technology transfer drives a huge amount of economic value for this country. We know that. Um, the universities know that. Um, and so part of this is to raise the profile of the profession and of the value of intellectual uh, property as well as tech transfer. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to drive not only greater focus, uh, but change within the process that is necessary. Um, so it is a renewed national effort, actually. Um, it's side by side with the Patent and Trademark Office. We're closely working with the National Science Foundation and with their i -Corps program, but it really is together with all the federal agencies and the nation's science and technology enterprise. Um, our goal is to not only engage all of you, get your feedback, your comments, uh, but also stakeholders from industry, including industry that may have tried to work with the federal labs, um, frankly got tired of the brain damage that uh, they had uh, received by saying, wait a minute, what do you mean we can't negotiate for those types of intellectual property rights? I thought I could negotiate, I negotiated that with DOE, um, you know, why can't I do that with you? Um, wait a minute, I'm used to Space Act agreements, why can't I do that type of thing with you guys? Um, it, so we have a system across the nation where we have a breadth of models that have been used. Um, that may be confusing for industry, um, but it's also a chance for us to look at what has worked in support of federal tech transfer. Consider that a great experiment um, in best practices, an experiment in mechanisms that have worked. Um, at the Department of Energy System, where I was uh, working uh, recently, I, I worked closely with some of the people in this room. Uh, Rochelle Blaustein uh, was part of it. Uh, Dave Cagle, who of course is part of the National Advisory Council here to the FLC, um, and, uh, and many others in the federal labs, to put in place a more flexible mechanism that's now been authorized across uh, all of the Department of Energy labs. Um, it provided some of the flexibility that industry uh, needed, um, but it's not total flexibility. Um, and, and so are those types of mechanisms of interest, are they of value across the federal complex? Uh, let's use our diversity of experiences to look at a new level of performance across the federal science and technology enterprise. So we're not looking to be incremental we're looking to change the game in such a way that it makes life easier for all of us as intellectual property, technology transfer, commercialization professionals. We have challenges when it comes to conflict of interest. If somebody wants to be an entrepreneur, uh, they generally will have to resign their position, move on and do other things, and they may be actually caught up uh, in certain issues because it may be seen as favoritism if they're actually coming back to the laboratory where they used to work uh, to try to get jobs done uh, to commercialize their technology. Um, and so there are many other examples that, uh, that we have seen and uh, we truly intend uh, to unleash our uh, innovation system. It's, um, it's a great challenge for us um, and I want you to know that since I've worked in industry and tried to work with the federal labs, um, and frankly, sometimes wound up taking my business overseas because I could actually get the intellectual property rights and the clarity that I was looking for at, at similarly reasonable terms, um, I can tell you that I wanted to work with the U.S. federal labs, but it, uh, you know, we just couldn't get there. Um, and so I was, um, encouraged by uh, Admiral Richard Truly. Some of you may know him. Um, he uh, was a, a, an astronaut. He was a Navy Admiral. Um, he led the Challenger uh, incident um, investigation in, um, in, uh, on behalf of uh, Congress after having uh, left Georgia Tech Research Corporation where he was their, their president for some time. Um, and then he became my boss at the National Renewable Energy Lab and uh, you know, he said to me, it's so important for people in federal laboratories to have actually worked 
in industry um, and to be able to be the voice of industry within the federal system. Um, I've had sort of several goes at it, right? As, uh, as, as John was saying, you know, I've, I've, I've been like a little bit like a, a bad penny, you know, uh, kind of going back into an entrepreneurial venture and, and had the thrill of taking company public. Um, and, uh, and then coming back to the federal labs, hopefully uh, to advance our joint agenda. Uh, then going off and doing a business turnaround and starting up five companies and nonprofit. Um, and I'm delighted to be here as also a champion, as a spokesperson for each one of you for the great work that you do. Um, and I want to tell you that I get it. You know, I understand the challenges of having to explain to a company why, well, really, even though you're gonna sign that agreement and it says gov government march-in rights are there, and even though those march-in rights aren't very well defined, uh, trust us, they've really not been exercised. So, you know, you can, you can tell your board that it's, it's okay to sign off on the deal. Um, so I would like to work with you on simple issues like that for clarifying uh, those types of, of challenges. So uh, we use the term unleash. Now this is one of my favorite ski spots in Colorado. It's a great place to go. Um, that I believe happens to be Arapaho Basin, which is a place where the locals hang out. Um, but um, unleash to me uh, means to think about how do, how do we let it go? How do we enable things to go more rapidly? Uh, how do we strip out some of the time, some of the parent bureaucracy, um, uh, but also to maintain the right control. Um, and when, when you ski, you have to keep your balance, right? You have to maintain uh, control, understand those, those limits. Uh, and so, so that's a good thing, I think, for all of us uh, within the federal sector, whether we're um, government-owned, contractor-operated facilities or, or affiliated in some way um, with government-owned, government-operated facilities, we have a great uh, opportunity. We've heard some tremendous stories of success and best practices here. Um, our goal is to look at those best practices that have proven value for the United States um, and provide greater authorization across the federal laboratory system um, and indeed across all federally funded uh, research and development enterprise to utilize more of the toolkit uh, to enable success and to build the strong networks that are vital for U.S. innovation and ecosystems to help bring back the corporations that have uh, not worked very much with the federal labs, if at all, uh, over the past years. And quite frankly, we need to do this. We are in a time where Congress has recognized that uh, investment is necessary in science and technology. The FY18 budget cycle, I think all of us are familiar with the, with the outcomes there, uh, is a bipartisan recognition that federal science and technology is critically important because we also recognize the international challenges to U.S. competitiveness as well as the needs to address our aging U.S. science and technology infrastructure. Um, and so we need to change our business models, folks, uh, because the rest of the world is accelerating its pace um, and they're very well organized. If we look at the strategic research plan, for example, for China, you know, China 2025, I mean, they clearly lay out the technology areas where they wish to dominate uh, the world in terms of science and technology and, and commerce. And I think our Congress has seen the message, uh, has heard the stories, um, and they are also behind this initiative because they say that the more of the science and technology that we can get to work in the U.S. economy, the better off we'll be, the more competitive we'll be. And as we look at our strategic development areas as a nation, uh, that we'll be able to then more effectively engage with the private sector to bring more investment uh, to the interface at the federal labs and, and to our universities. Now, the Bayh-Dole Act and the Stevenson-Weidler Act uh, from 1980 were really transformative for America. So we're not looking to go back to the pre-1980s days, right? Because everybody was given you know, simple access to license and therefore nobody commercialized. I mean, that was the issue. 
Uh, so by Dole, as we look at what it's done for our university system, by providing rights in ownership and stewardship of the intellectual assets and, and enabling entrepreneurship, uh, created a great incentive to U.S. innovation to drive active development through translational research and to disseminate research and development results to spur commercial technology adoption. And we've seen several updates to the Federal Technology Transfer uh, Acts, and of course that created the role um, in the Department of Commerce for the Undersecretary of Commerce, uh, for the NIST director to have a leadership role for federal technology transfer as part of the U.S. innovation system. You know, that's why I'm here today. It's part of my job. It's also part of my passion. And, um, and, and it's the reason uh, I believe that, that the leadership for federal tech transfer is side by side with our patent and trademark office in the Department of Commerce because it's about ensuring that America uh, gets the value. Now, we are, um, I believe, at, uh, at an important inflection point. We're looking at some important new outcomes. What are the critically needed improvements to our federal technology transfer efforts? Let's identify them. Uh, as part of the response to the request uh, for information, each of your labs and also the FLC as an entity has the opportunity to provide comment. Uh, we're going to be having four sessions as part of this national conversation um, uh, in various parts of the country. And uh, we invite you, uh, on behalf of, uh, of your uh, federal labs, come on down. You know, uh, have your voice be heard. Uh, and uh, not only uh, write a little, but write a lot on the things that are important to you. Um, because it's going to be the job of NIST uh, as part of this interagency process to bring together the ideas from all sides um, and to, to ensure that we have a righteous process that permits people who have been perhaps naysayers about certain things to also be heard um, because our goal is to have an inclusive approach uh, and may the best ideas win. Um, I mentioned before that some U.S. companies have become disillusioned uh, with working with the federal labs. And or some of them don't even know how to effectively work with us. Uh, they try to find technologies. Um, sometimes it's a bit more difficult than they would like or they feel that they have to develop an individual relationship with every single federal lab. Um, and, uh, and, and so as we look to the future, um, are there ways in which we can provide our information about technologies and inventions uh, more easily, more readily? Um, are there new partnering models that we can use across the federal system with U.S. industry, with academia, uh, that it's truly long overdue? Um, you know, I think we've, we've dealt with certain challenges again and again, um, and I know that when I was in, the, uh, in, in uh, many of your chairs in the, uh, in the federal labs, you know, I found it necessary sometimes to explain to people who had actually worked across other federal labs, why we do it uh, this way. And I think we can simplify things for our uh, constituents. Uh, so this is intended to be a comprehensive approach. And uh, we're seeking some important uh, outcomes as we look to maximize the transfer of federal investment in science and technology into value for America. It's still all about promoting innovation, U.S. economic growth and national security, but also to attract greater private sector investment to create the innovative products and services, new businesses, whole new industries uh, that we need. And so what are those critically needed improvements? What's working really well? What, what do we really need to, to keep? What are the best practices that we can point to uh, that, we, that we aspire to? We also know that in some ways we have authorities that are not being fully utilized, or in some cases the directors of our laboratories may not have a focus, a priority on technology transfer. Um, part of this initiative is meant to raise the level of profile of their accountability uh, in, in that part of the job. And uh, ultimately, um, as we look at 
how do we more um, effectively attract private sector investment? Are there some new tools that we can use? For example, SBIR, STTR have been very useful for us, uh, but there are many technologies that are still challenged in the valley of death problem, right? How do you get to working prototype? Are there different models or are there extensions to our existing tools that we can utilize that will enable de-risking of technologies such that we can have uh, appropriate engagement with industry. Um, and we know, for example, that almost every drug that's on the market today, every biomedical device uh, is a result of federally funded research. So things are going well, but um, our friends in NIH will also share with you that the return on investment model um, of the pharmaceutical industry is increasingly challenged. Um, and the ac absolute returns uh, on pharma, even though federally funded research is the primary pipeline for new drugs, um, that the pharmaceutical industry is, is continuing uh, to face challenges in justifying the significant investments that, uh, that, uh, that are required. So much to do. But I think there's some excitement in Washington. And, you know, with, with a town where there's a lot of sort of noise and, uh, and uh, sometimes bickering, um, you know, I think that there's been um, a lot of energy that is beginning to be released now as part of this uh, national conversation. And I'm delighted that we are all part of that. So here's a little bit about our timeline. We've, we've done a little bit of pre-selling of this, uh, as mentioned uh, earlier on. Uh, we have a website uh, that has been established for uh, information and for updates about this cross-agency uh, initiative. Uh, we had our launch event on the 19th of April. Um, the video of that event is available on the NIST website. I think you'll enjoy seeing it, especially from the beginning. Uh, where Secretary Ross comes out very strongly behind federal technology transfer as a key part of the U.S. innovation system. Um, we have the uh, request for information in the Federal Register Notice uh, to come out in the next few days together with the press release. Be on the lookout for that. And, uh, and then over the coming weeks, uh, we will have four events on the 14th of May at the uh, U.S. Patent and Trademark Office in Silicon Valley. Uh, we'll be having uh, the first of our events, um, and it'll be primarily a listening session on the West Coast. So West Coast Labs, hey, show up. It'll be, it'll be fun, but it'll also be an opportunity for your comments to be made on the record. On the 21st of May um, in Denver, uh, we were trying to hold it at the PTO, but their facility was not um, available as, as we needed it, so it's at the Renaissance Hotel in downtown Denver, again from 9 to 12 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, in Chicago on the 31st of May at the Chicago Hilton um, at, um, where, where is that, uh, Oak something, <laughs> pardon? Oak Grove, that's the one. Oak Brook. I believe that's the one. You'll see it on the website. You'll see it in the Federal Register notice. And uh, <laughs> Henry, you probably know where that is. Um, and then the last one will be held uh, in the DC area, actually at the NIST Gaithersburg facility on June the 14th, uh, again from 9 until noon. And um, it's, uh, everyone will have a chance for a limited time of comment, but people will be able to go back with, with comments on the various questions that are part of the request for information. And um, I, I think it, it should be said, it's, it, this is not an exaggeration. It's really an important time for our country. Uh, we are facing unprecedented challenges. We have the greatest innovation system in the world. Let's not forget that. But this is all about making it better, easier. What are the frustrations that you've had over the last X number of years working in federal technology transfer or on this other side of the table um, negotiating with uh, people in federal technology transfer. Uh, think about those things and let's talk about them. And at the end of our session today, 
I'd like to invite you to come up to the microphones um, and provide your comments, provide your suggestions, uh, provide your views on uh, the vision for this initiative. So it's time to unleash our brains, yeah? Uh, but also, I think the record is pretty clear. I mean, some of the things that I mentioned, things like march in rights, things like government use license, some of these things are in legislation, but as I say, there are people who are ready to support the kinds of changes that, uh, that make sense for our country. So here's the website. It's the nist.gov website forward slash TPO forward slash ROI. Very simple. And so the links to the videos, the feedback from our various forums uh, will be there. The information, location, the actual locations, and, uh, and the dates and times uh, will all be available on that website together with the uh, request for information, which, which will be published shortly. So I sincerely hope that the FLC will take action, that you will personally look upon this as your opportunity to have your voice heard, because it's being heard through many, many forums, and, uh, and I think it's a chance to bring this together as part of our, our national conversation, and, uh, and to look at those things that can be accomplished across the entire federal complex. Those things that we can sincerely rally behind, and perhaps there are new opportunities for us to pilot uh, new structures, new tools. Certain um, federal agencies, for example, have uh, foundations that have been established in support of the technology transformation. For example, NIH uh, has such a foundation. Uh, to what extent can those tools be used to manage some of the issues around conflict of interest? Because now you have a separate body uh, that's able to, uh, to be an intermediary. Um, and to enable some entrepreneurial activities to happen. There are many other models that have been utilized across the federal complex. You know them much better than I. You've, you've been living uh, in this world. Um, part of our goal uh, in also engaging with universities is to look at what academia has done in building innovation ecosystems. What are the aspects of Baidol uh, that are, are still being challenged um, and how can we utilize this initiative to strengthen and clarify some of the provisions of the Bayh-Dole Act uh, as affects not only universities but also federal laboratories. Um, and so I sincerely want to say thank you for welcoming me back. It's great to see uh, such great friends here, uh, people that I've enjoyed uh, a beer or two with over past years uh, in some interesting places wherever FLC has had its national uh, meetings or its regional meetings. Um, I feel totally at home, and uh, I'm honored to be uh, here as the Under Secretary of Commerce, but really as a, as a member of the FLC and looking to the future together with you for how we can move the American innovation system forward. Thank you. So I deliberately left time for people to come up. That's not and, what I was hoping for. Yeah, and, and so I've got a bunch of things that I've already mentioned. I've got a whole list of things that we know need to be addressed. But now is time for you. Um, there are microphones on, on either side. Um, if, um, if some of you want to come up and, and talk about what some of your goals would be in this return on investment, initiative for unleashing American innovation. Hey, Walter. Um, it's Ron Casey at TechCo. So let me um, make an easy one, OK? Um, some years ago, I was a, an expert presenter for the uh, NSF Greer Committee and uh, in front of a bunch of academics. And I brought up a concept that seemed completely foreign to them called deemed export. And I suggested that um, since they had an exception for export restrictions on basic research, that was fine. But as academia was getting more and more applied research uh, efforts going, 
and especially applied research on behalf of the federal labs, like in our um, uh, centers of excellence that we've been funding, that the waiver does not apply for applied research. And deemed expert, uh, export is a simple concept. You don't have to ship something overseas to export it. If you have a foreign student on a research project, you're putting that technology in their head. And because they're a foreign student, not a citizen or a green card holder, you have officially exported that. And China has been exploiting that now for at least a decade that I know of. And because I have a Chinese wife, I've heard Chinese citizens bragging on that use. So if we would just look at deemed export and apply it, I think we're going to solve one big problem. Thank you. Great point. Um, one of the other things to um, comment on as somebody who's been active with the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, um, we typically count U.S. patents that, uh, that come from our federal laboratories, um, research and development. As a result, we uh, create a, a patent right within this country. Um, we have no enforcement rights anywhere outside the world, uh, outside the United States and the rest of the world. Um, and uh, the role of patents is to teach. Therefore, we teach the world, who of course reads US patents, and, uh, and patent applications as well. Um, and so one of the very simple things we can look at as a federal laboratory consortium is are we protecting US commercial interests by only seeking patent rights in this nation? versus providing our licensees and our partners access to intellectual property rights elsewhere. Important thing to think about as we look at simple practices, we are authorized, of course, to seek um, international patents and seek licensees um, and, uh, and to file within the PCT rather than just within the US P uh, PTO. Um, and, uh, and yet it's a minority of our intellectual properties that are actually um, protected uh, for global use for uh, America's global competitiveness. Uh, other comments? Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'm Mujde Bohar from USDA. Uh, one of the initiatives that actually started under the last administration and came to a halt because we hit a brick wall legally, uh, was uh, the issue of large entity. As you know, the U.S. government is perceived as a large entity, and you know, one could argue that we are. But uh, the issue is, as far as patent fees are concerned, this really dissuades small businesses with coming in and working with the federal government if they are supposed to, you know, if, if their filing fees goes all of a sudden from $1,000 to $5,000. So we had asked colleagues at the USPTO to look at this, and they looked at that. Um, we didn't get far um, in that venture with the PTO, and then we decided maybe we should go through the SBA and see what their definition of small business is, and can we go under that. But as somebody, as the Undersecretary for Commerce that works closely with the PTO, maybe that's a low-hanging fruit that we can at least um, either talk about and fix, or if it's for whatever reason not fixable, um, be able to explain why is it that, you know, universities that some of which, you know, for example, MIT, the, you know, some people say it's what, the 10th economy in the world, um, they are perceived as a small entity and the U.S. government is not. So it does create an un, um, unequal playing ground. Yeah. And given that, rightly or wrongly, we get compared to universities all the time, no matter how much we try to change the narrative, yeah. um, I think we ought to address that. I'm so glad you mentioned that. That's on the list. And uh, the uh, preparations are already underway um, of documents uh, uh, with the PTO to address this matter, because it is actually within the jurisdiction uh, of the PTO, and we'll help, have to help them uh, to um, 
understand uh, these matters. Um, and uh, I, I, this is a, a topic that I've uh, discussed at some length with, uh, with Henry uh, Wixon, who's uh, general counsel at, uh, at NIST and who's working with us on this matter. And if I just may add. And I would go as far as saying that the, the agencies are unequally affected because some agencies, by the uh, nature of what they do, work with small business, right. more small businesses historically than right. others. Yeah. So, so we are not all affected equally, but it would be great if it got addressed. No, ab absolutely. Thank you for that uh, very important point. Barry Dantloff, U.S. Army, uh, Fort Detrick. Can I ask a stupid question? <laughs> what? <laughs> Can I? Okay. Why, why should we have to pay for patents? We all work for Uncle Sam. You want to increase innovation out of the federal labs, kill the patent fees. <laughs> Actually, I, I, I did have another question. <laughs> And, and it's no, ab absolutely. He, he had the answer <laughs> embedded in the question. And, and this is another stupid one. Um, why is it DOD has different tech transfer laws than NIH and HHS and others? Why can't we have one set of laws? Industry can't deal with the differences. Yeah. What a scathingly brilliant idea. <laughs> and, and I do believe that harmonizing, unifying, and creating a broader toolkit for all of our federal entities um, in a way that makes it much simpler for U.S. industry, corporations, large and small, down to the individual inventor to engage with us so much the better. Please. You, yeah, uh, there's, an, uh, there's a mic right there because it's, been re it's being recorded. Thank you. Yes, so I was wondering, you know, we're talking about transferring the technology, but much of our trouble is getting the innovators to disclose. So is that anywhere in this, in this discussion that you're having? Um, we've, I, I work for NASA, and we've lost um, quite a bit of our, we have an inventions and contribution board. It used to have funding. We used to, to give a little bit of a uh, award for, disclosing and we still are able to re reward those who whose technology ends up in a patent yeah. but there is much innovation that doesn't follow the path to a patent and and it is much it is very discouraging yeah. for a lot of our innovators and so the only thing we have right now is that well you must the law says you right. that's not an incentive <laughs> Yes, I must pay taxes. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm wondering if, if you know if you're going to look at the full life cycle of it, you have to consider that what's in it for them, and and it doesn't have to be monetary. There are many other ways that that bring honor and recognition to to the innovators. I think. That is an incredibly important point, and it's certainly part of this initiative, is looking at all the aspects that are the feeder system for our inventions, um, including are the incentives right, and, uh, and also um, what, are the, what are some of the blockages that are, that are in the way today? You almost think about a river that's been dammed up by a beaver, and some of you may have seen uh, examples of that, it's just one little stick at a time. And sometimes it only takes one stick to be removed and all of a sudden the dam breaks and lots of great things happen. Uh, also some damage may happen. Uh, but uh, I, I think here it, it's important for us to look at that entire ecosystem and where there are um, incentives to be considered because as we look simply at, um, at the Federal lab statistics and the report, the FY uh, 
2015 report uh, that's assembled from all the FLC uh, data uh, will, be, um, uh, will be published uh, very, very shortly. Uh, we'll see those statistics and compare them with the autumn statistics, for example, on number of in invention disclosures uh, per billion dollars invested. Um, and the federal labs are roughly uh, one-tenth as productive in terms of the number of inventions disclosed. Um, I may be, it, it, it's, it, it's approximately an order of, a mag order of magnitude uh, difference. Um, and uh, so you'll be able to see the a actual numbers. Uh, but the important point there is getting the incentives right and, uh, and, and also opening up the doors uh, through taking what are sometimes these small uncertainties that have built up uh, on the other side of the table uh, to create uh, the kind of engagement with industry and with our innovation ecosystems that are so necessary. Thank you. Uh, my name's Cameron, I work with the Naval Research Laboratory and I've worked with uh, the DOD and then I went with the DOE and then I left to try and commercialize technologies on my own uh, from different uh, laboratories across the country and <clears throat> being the, an ROI program, that was my number one issue at the end of the day is getting these technologies that were at the basic research. It wasn't the value of the patents, but then when you would try and raise funds, and a lot of these I would pick a scientist that would want to go with the lab. They were going to leave anyway. But to be able to raise cash, there was no ROI to any investor at that small s scale. And I know in the tech transfer community, we go for, you know, we have to have a uh, small business preference, but that startup or that entrepreneur that could really drive that life of the technology, we don't have tools to get them cash. Yes, there's SBIR, there's the prototype programs, there's state economics, but there's no way to help an entrepreneur and a team really get cash. And from an investor standpoint, when it's in that pitch deck, they don't see the patent license agreement alone, especially with the federal lab, because it's so risky as really valuable and that they're gonna get ROI. So, I, I think your experience is, uh, it is a very, very important uh, uh, benchmark for all of us. Um, and I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and, and uh, spin out companies uh, on, on both sides, you know, on, as an investor um, and, and also within the federal labs. Um, and I think that um, it's just so important for us to look at that very clear value proposition for the technologies. How do we make the opportunity genuinely investable. Um, and uh, I mean, ultimately the market will decide, but uh, clearly uh, we should not be putting roadblocks in place um, and making things overly complex uh, for, our, uh, for our entrepreneurs who genuinely put it all on the line. Um, you know, I, I, having started a, a number of companies, uh, you know, you go without salary for a while and you're trying to feed a family and, and all the other uh, issues that come along with that. It certainly focuses the mind. And when, uh, when you're um, negotiating with somebody who doesn't share a sense of urgency, um, it's really, it's really soul destroying for the entrepreneur. Being an entrepreneur is, is tough. Entrepreneurs need a lot of love and it goes beyond, you know, their, their family circle and their, um, immediate friends, uh, including all the ones at the bar that they go down to on a Friday saying, oh, I wish. Uh, so it's, it's really important as we look at our systems of innovation, and federal labs are of course quite different from universities, but many of us have interns, we have postdocs who work at the laboratories, um, people who are closely associated with us, and sort of building those innovation uh, ecosystems and also simplifying uh, the work of the entrepreneur. There have been some models that have been tried, for example, when I was at the DOE system and as part of the, um, uh, uh, the uh, efforts around accelerating innovation, we put in place a standard option template, a very low cost template uh, that was just very simple and sweet and, uh, and allowed simply the entrepreneur to get started with an option. And um, there are, I think, many other models as well that uh, we can look at in terms of standardizing and, and best practices. But uh, those points that you make are incredibly poignant uh, because it's, it's so true that um, if people are going to be uh, leaving the laboratory, even for a time to serve as the 
founder or the chief science officer of a new co, um, how do we help them get there? And um, uh, it's not sort of a conflict of interest type of an issue if somebody's doing that for the benefit of the economy and have a passion for the technology. Um, you know, the word profit is not a bad word in this country. I mean, this, this is, you know, this, this is the obvious outcome that we're seeking is to create sustainable enterprises that have valuable products that the marketplace is willing to compensate them for. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Mowat from NIH. Uh, I was intrigued by a, a comment you made early in your talk about uh, an experience you had when you were in the private sector and you were talking about an inability to, to close a deal with, uh, I assume it was a, a federal laboratory. Yeah. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what the holdup was there. Was that a, was that a statutory regulatory limitation or, or some other aspect? Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for that, uh, that question. Yeah, it was, it was really a combination of effects. Part of it was the lack of clarity around intellectual property rights and, and under what circumstances would the government be able to exercise the government use license? Would it be research only? Um, if this was really seen as a strategic growth area for the country, would there an exception be made or would the government be able to, uh, to march in? So it was kind of a lack of clarity about that. But um, I think the other uh, part of it was just uh, looking at the potential entanglement of uh, the company's trade secrets um, as part of a CRADA, uh, there are certain uh, gives and, and, and takes, um, and, uh, and, and there, there's lack of clarity or, um, if there was an invention or if there was a trade secret that was connected with the subject matter of a CRADA um, that we would actually wind up contaminating the company's intellectual property rights or creating uncertainty uh, for the future as a result of simply having engaged with the federal lab. And that was a risk for that particular technology that we were unwilling to take. Now I must say that you know, on the subject of NIH, um, one of the first deals that my company, Lubrizol Corporation, uh, did in our venture group uh, was to invest in a tiny startup company that had a license to the Cohen-Boyer patents a little company called Genentech. And, um, and as the lead investor in, in that uh, little company, um, we saw tremendous power in, in that particular technology that had sort of multiple licensees and, and multiple channels of, of use. So having sort of the appropriate licensing strategy, looking at fields of, of use, uh, exclusive versus non-exclusive licensing, we saw that federally funded research could lead to just incredible platform technologies. And, uh, and so the um, NIH has done an absolutely phenomenal job and uh, just delighted to be working with Francis Collins and, and the, uh, the rest of the leadership team there as well, looking to the future, uh, also in creating greater clarity uh, for, uh, for investors as uh, there continue to be attacks on exclusive licensing rights, um, that's, that seems to be a daily um, activity at NIH now, kind of fending off uh, various special interest groups and, and so on, uh, who seem to be wanting to, uh, to hold up the rights of companies to take technologies. Thank you. One last question, if, if we may. Thank you all. For, thank you all for being here. Thanks for hanging out. I love it. Hi, I'm Jennifer Stewart. I'm with one of the Navy Warfare Centers. I know this is being recorded, so I was tempted to say I'm Strawberry Shortcake for Gargamel, Inc. Um, just because <laughs> being within the DOD and as a federal employee, um, if I can even comment on these particular issues um, based upon my experience and not representing the agency or my lab, um, you know, if I were to be published somewhere saying, Jennifer Stewart said this about the Navy's tech transfer program, uh, could be come back kind of negative on me, right? So I'm using this forum to uh, have permission to really speak from a practitioner's point of view. And one of my frustrations, uh, one of the many, um, has been that when Congress asked DOD to start tracking all of our physical items, 
and, and we got ERP, and we got our OMS material management folks, and our center now has a whole entire department of like 30 people monitoring and tracking washers and bolts and screws and purchases, and yet our intellectual capital is not managed whatsoever. To, I mean, it is from within my office, but we actually have managers who tell their folks don't even come and talk to me because I'm a distraction from their everyday work. And so, and I have in inventors who say, please don't tell my managers that I came to your office today. But yet because our materials are tracked and those fall under FIR and those fall under IG inspections, they get all the resources they need to manage those assets. But when it comes to intellectual capital, I'm an office of one and no one in the hierarchy is measured on their tech transfer performance. Nowhere in their performance or metrics to their bosses is there any incentive for them to care. And so not that I want a lot of audits put on myself, <laughs> not that I want a tech transfer IG, but if it gets the intellectual capital to be recognized and managed, I am welcome to take on that burden. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that, and you're not alone. And um, I'm also looking forward to uh, working with the new um, Undersecretary for Science at the uh, Department of Defense, who's just recently been named. And uh, uh, I know that, uh, that this whole topic of, of innovation technology transfer is very important to him. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, look forward to your 